Okay, I made a decision in the last 30 seconds to use the blackboard. So I'm just going to pull it up for a minute. Okay. Okay. Because the reason I wanted to do this is that because I have a lot that I'm going to be talking about. One of the biggest things is called hypothesis. And also, thank you. I would Sorry, really I appreciate, that. very much appreciate the questions coming at the end so that um, you know I can get through the material. And if any of you secretly know the answers to my questions, keep them to yourself. <laughs> but uh, anyways, first thing, hypothesis. Okay. My hypothesis is that Christ was a student of Philo Judaeus. And Philo was a, uh, a Jewish rabbi in Alexandria, Egypt. And um, I think, well, the Bible says in St. Matthew that the uh, Mary and Joseph and Jesus had to get out of Bethlehem fast because there was going to be a major killing of all infant boys under the age of two. So an angel appears to Joseph in his dream and says, you should go to Egypt. Now, outside of that, there's very little we know about Jesus until he starts his, his real ministry when he's about 30 years old. And if he went to Egypt, more than likely, they ended up in Alexandria, which was the cosmopolitan city at the time. And in Alexandria, you had uh, a Greek sex section of town, a Jewish uh, section of town, uh, a Coptic section of town. And you had Philo, who was a very important thinker. And Philo comes out of Plato. He's a complete Platonist, and uh, I'll be talking about Plato, and we'll be doing a little discussion of Plato um, a, little, a little soon. So that's my hypothesis, is this that uh, Christ was educated by Philo, who in turn was educated by Plato. So there's this magnificent golden string that sort of winds its way from ant antiquity from Moses to Plato to Philo to Christ, et, et cetera, et cetera. All right? The, you're dealing with a, a, a theme which is man created in the image of God. This theme runs throughout all of uh, history. And the Zeus versus Prometheus principle comes very much alive here. Because uh, it's, I mean, it's pretty obvious in the in Christ's time, Zeus was the Roman Empire. It was Tiberius. It was Caligula. You know, it was these you know rotten Caesars who took over the world and basically killed people. And Plato's time, you have the Zeus Prometheus principle with Plato being Prometheus against the, um, the, the, the uh, Athenic, um, the um, governing body of Athens at that time. And um, so anyways, that's, that's my hypothesis. Now hypothesis come in, um, come in pairs, and I wanted to just, who knows what a hypothesis is? Raise your hand. Okay. When you have a hypothesis, it's basically an idea that you want to prove, okay? So, a hypothesis, for example, let's put it this way, it could be, um, 
as simple as man burning wood for energy. Okay? It's a wood burning society. That would be the first hypothesis. And then you would have a higher hypothesis. Okay, and that would be from a wood burning society to a coal burning society. Okay, and this jump from wood to coal, what does it do? It allows you to have more people on the planet. Okay, you, if you keep burning wood and you run out of it, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to eat, you're going to die, you're not going to have housing. In coal, you're, deal, you're dealing with a much denser form of energy. And then we have what we would call hypothesizing the higher hypothesis. And anybody want to take a guess on that? That would be nuclear. And then there's something that is on top of all of that, which is the unhypothesized. Un the unhypothesized good or God. So you're, you're moving from, you know, you're building up from hypothesis to the good, okay? From one level to the next. And it's all based on truths. It's all based on axioms that you can prove. So you're moving from wood burning, you know, all the way up through nu nuclear, and then you come to the unhypothesized hypothesis, which actually is, you know, is, is God, is the good. There's another way to, um, to look at this thing. Let's take, um, knowledge of, uh, let's see, hypothesis. Um, Ptolemy. Ptolemy lived in Greece. His idea of the planets and whatnot was just that the Earth was the center of the solar system. Well, he didn't even talk about a solar system. He just said the Earth is the center of everything. And then he just sort of made up you know, a whole bunch of stuff about how the sun revolved around this and that planet revolved around that. And so, you know, you just basically had this mess uh, of a hypothesis and it was overthrown, proven wrong, by a higher hypothesis that came out from, let's say, Copernicus. Okay, Copernicus, Copernicus maintained that the sun was the center of the universe, okay, not the earth, but he still had most everything wrong until you had Kepler, and Kepler actually describes not only the sun and the earth, but he actually talks about the force that makes all of this move which is the idea of the sun and gravitation. So he really, you know, uh, he takes this thing far, all the way out. And um, Kepler is one of the most important people uh, to get to know when you're studying uh, how the world works. Um, I would like to show you an example of, I think I want the, um, 
give me the uh, the uh, grid on population grid. Is that on here? You have to open up the uh, the LEO article and then go through find the pages on it. Where did you uh, Where did you keep it? Downloads. That was uh, our magazine going back to 1995. It's almost 20 years old. Um, what's, Lynn, the, what's the name this of it? Is, what is God that man is in his image? This is an article by Lynn. Just page down. Using the yeah. Top. Go ahead. Page down. So let me know when to stop. Okay. Keep going. Stop. <laughs> oh, I guess we don't want to see that bigger. Yeah. Yeah, let me blow the image. Blow up the image. There we go. Oh, the reason that I wanted to talk about, um, I mentioned coal, wood, and oil, has to do with this over here. Okay? Is any, are people familiar with this? Raise your hand if you're familiar with this. What is this? This graph here, the population graph. Yes. You know it, you know it. Okay. This graph here goes through, if you look down, you have 100,000 BC, 10,000 BC, 5, 1,000 BC, 400, and so forth. And as you go through here, you have populate, population growth. That's the top line, the blue line here, if you can see it. So you can see that the population growth of the planet is, you know, it's really sort of steady until you get to about the, the period here uh, when it goes up a little bit and then it comes down again during the Black Death, okay, which hit Europe. And then it comes, it comes out of the pit there, and then through up into about the American Revolution, which is about there, and then it skyrockets, okay? And this is, this is exactly uh, the um, idea, the scheme, that Al Gore has in his book, yeah, Al Gore uses this to prove why there are too many people in the world and why we should cut back because look at this, you know, huge amount of population that we have. So the environmentalists, of course, their idea is just that you have to destroy science, you have to destroy creativity. And um, so he, he uses this thing for, to make his evil point. And um, so the hypothesizing of the higher hypothesis is your movement from, from a wood burning to a coal burning to a nuclear burning and finally, you know, we'll get to fusion. We might get to fusion in about 10 years time. It's that possible if we uh, overthrow Obama now we could have fusion within about 10, or maybe a little more than that, years. Um, now, I wanted to, um, to give people an idea <coughs> a 
about how how we know how we know God and basically um, what Lynn goes through in his paper as he talks about um, <coughs> how Pope John Paul II made a statement against Buddhism and um, he just basically um, said that he took it to task, um, and I'll tell you why, because basically the, the Buddhist believes that um, it doesn't matter if you're good or bad, you should remove yourself from all earthly pleasures or earthly pains, and that the perfect state is nirvana and that you should be above all knowledge, all knowing, all people, and just put yourself, you know, in this state of nirvana. And you, you, the Pope said, this is not true. This is, this is evil. This is, well, he didn't, I don't think he went so far as to say it was evil, but he did condemn it. And so the Buddhists got actually pretty angry um, at what he said. Sounds like they were from Nirvana. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They left in Nirvana to get, <laughs> to get insulted. <laughs> they let his statement get the better of them. So here's, here's what the Pope said, actually. Uh, he said, uh, we do not free ourselves from evil through good, which comes from God. We liberate ourselves only through detachment from the world which is bad. The fullness of such detachment is not union with God, but what is called nirvana, a state of perfect indifference with regard to the world. To save oneself means above all to free oneself from evil by becoming indifferent to the world, which is the source of evil. And this is the culmination of the spiritual progress. So that's what you're getting in the idea of Buddha. And this is, I mean, what you have as opposed to that is Judeo-Christian Islamic culture, where the idea is that there is a God, a one God, and that God is a good God. And that man uh, wants to strive and imitate towards that goodness. So um, this is uh, this is uh, coming out of um, uh, Plato, I think, in a big way, uh, because Plato is dealing with he's living in in Greece, where people have Apollo, they have Venus, they have. Um, one god after the other, they have Zeus, all of Olympus, but um, Plato actually believes in one god, and he says so. I mean, he doesn't say, I disbelieve all the other gods, but he does talk about God as the one, as the good. Okay, so Plato comes out and does that, which I think is one of the reasons that they wanted to kill him. Um, I'd like to demonstrate what Plato did uh, in this, in a short thing, as a dialogue between Socrates and Mino. So Dana has agreed that he's going to be Mino and I'm going to be Socrates. <laughs> and the question is on virtue. Is there virtue? And if there is, what is it? Uh, can we know it? So that's, that's the question at hand. And um, Socrates says, and will virtue differ in its character as virtue, whether it be in a child or an old man, a woman or a man? Can you tell me, Socrates? Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to start from the beginning. 
Oh, we have the wrong. No, no, this is this is how we're supposed to start right there. Uh, you're supposed to start there. Remember? Can you tell me, Socrates? Is virtue mm -hmm. something that can't be? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa! I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. Okay, I'm sorry. I ran ahead of myself. Go ahead, Mino. <laughs> can you tell me, Socrates? Is virtue something that can be taught, or does it come by practice? Or is it neither teaching nor practice that gives it to a man, but natural aptitude or something else? Well, Nino, in the good old days of the Thessalonians, they had a great reputation among the Greeks for their wealth and their horsemanship. And then he talks about the Thessalians and, the, and these, these other men in Greece and then he comes to a point, I'm not going to go through the whole dialogue because it would be boring for me just to read it. So I'll just go to certain points. And he says, um, uh, there is a dearth of wisdom, and it looks as if it had migrated from our part of the country to yours. At any rate, if you put your question to any of our people, they will all like laugh and say, you must think I'm singularly fortunate to know whether virtue can be taught or how it is acquired. The fact is that far from knowing whether it can be taught, I have no idea whatsoever what virtue is. This is my own case. I share the poverty of my fellow countrymen in this respect and confess to my shame that I have no knowledge about virtue at all. How can I know a property of something when I don't even know what it is? Do you suppose that somebody entirely ignorant who Mino is could say whether he is handsome and rich and well-born or the reverse? Is that possible, do you think? No, but is this true about yourself, Socrates, that you don't even know what virtue is? Is this the report that we are to take home about you? Not only that, you may also say that to the best of my belief, I have never met anyone who did know. <laughs> what? Didn't you meet Gorgias when he was here? Yes. And you still didn't think he knew? I'm a forgetful sort of person, and I can't say now what I thought at the time. Probably he did know, and I expect you know that he used to, what he used to say about it. So remind me what it was, or tell me yourself, if you will. No doubt you agree with him. Yes, I do. Then let's leave him out of it, since after all he isn't here. What do you yourself say virtue is? I do ask you in all earnestness not to refuse me, but to speak out. I shall only be too happy to be proved wrong if you and Gorgias turn out to know this, although I said I had never met anyone who did. But there is no difficulty about it. First of all, if it is manly virtue, you are after, it is easy to see that the virtue of a man consists in managing the city's affairs capably, and so that he will help his friends and injure his foes while taking care to come to no harm himself. Or if you want a woman's virtue, that is easily described. She must be a good housewife, careful with her stores and obedient to her husband. Then. There is another virtue for a child, male or female, and another for an old man, free or slave as you like, and as a great many, and as and a great many more kinds of virtue, so that no one need be at a loss to say what it is. For every act and every time of life, with reference to each separate function, there is a virtue for each one of us. And similarly, I should say, a vice. I seem to be in luck. I wanted one virtue, and I find that you have a whole swarm of virtues <laughs> to offer. But seriously, to carry on this metaphor of the swarm, suppose I asked you what a bee is. What is its essential nature? And you replied that bees were of many different kinds. What would you say if I went on to ask, and is it in but being bees, that there are many and various and different from one another? Or would you agree that it is not in this respect that they differ, but in something else? 
some other quality like size or beauty. I should say that insofar as they are bees, they don't differ from one another at all. Oh, well, suppose I then continued, well, this is just what I want you to tell me. What is the character in respect of which they don't differ at all, but are all the same? I presume you have something to say. I should. Then do the same with virtues. Even if they are many and various, yet at least they all have some common character which makes them virtues. That is what ought to be kept in view by anyone who answers the question, what is virtue? Do you follow me? I think I do, but I don't yet really grasp the question as I should wish. Well, does this apply in your mind only to virtue, that there is a different one for a man and a woman and the rest? Is it the same with health and size and strength, or has health the same character everywhere? If it's health, whether it be in a man or other creature, I agree that health is the same in a man or in a woman. And what about size and strength? If a woman is strong, and will it be the same thing, the same strength that makes her strong? My meaning is that in its character as strength, it is no different whether it be man or in a woman. Or do you think it is? No. And will virtue differ in its character as virtue, whether it be a child or an old man, a woman or a man? I somehow feel that this is not on the same level as the other cases. Well then, didn't you say that man's virtue lay in directing the city well, and the woman's in directing her household well? Yes. And is it possible to direct anything well, city or household, or anything else, if not temperately and justly? Certainly not. And that means with temperance and justice. Of course. Then both men and women need the same quality, justice and temperance, if they are going to be good. It looks like it. And what about your child, an old man? Could they be good? if they were in, incontinent and unjust? Of course not. They must be temperate and just. Yes. So everyone in, in, is good in the same way since they become good by possessing the same qualities. So it seems. And if they did not share the same virtue, they would not be good in the same way. No. Seeing then that they all have the same virtue, try to remember and tell me what gorgeous in you who share his opinion say it is. It must be simply the capacity to govern men if you are looking for one quality to cover all the instances. Indeed I am. But does this virtue apply to a child, a slave? Should a slave be capable of governing his master? And if he does, is he still a slave? I hardly think so. It certainly doesn't sound likely. And here is another point. You speak of capacity to govern. Shall we not add justly, but not otherwise? I think we should, for justice is virtue. Virtue, do you say, or a virtue? What do you mean? Something quite general. Take roundness, for instance. I should say it is a shape. Not simply that it is a shape, my reason being that there are many other shapes as well. I see your point, and I agree that there are other virtues besides justice. Then tell me what they are, just as I could name other shapes if you told me, in the same way you mentioned some other virtues. In my opinion, then, courage is a virtue, and temperance and wisdom and dignity and many other things. This puts us back to where we were in a different way. We have discovered a number of virtues when we were looking for only one, the single virtue that permeates each of them. We cannot find. So what you see what he does, I hope that was clear. But Basically, Socrates is looking for what is virtue. 
and he and what, but instead of giving him an answer, people can't. So Socrates basically does this in most every one of his dialogues. When somebody says they know what courage is, they go through this whole thing, and at the end, they don't know what courage is. And Socrates says, neither do I. His, the idea of Socrates, what he is always trying to do, is he is attempting to um, get you to think. He says, Socrates says that I am a midwife of ideas. He says, I don't actually give birth to ideas, but I help others attain knowledge. Now, what happens to Socrates, some of you uh, may or may not know, is, is that basically the state came down on him and uh, tried him. And they tried him, um, and, his, and the and the charge was that he was um, um, ruining the morals of the young people. That his ruining of the morals of young people was uh, a crime and that he should pay for it with his life. So basically what, what happens is, you want to show that? Thing by Socrates. Which one is it? Yeah. It's uh, just first one. It's not that one. The other one. Yeah, that one. Death of Socrates. This here. This one. Yes. The other one's better. Oh, oh it's others better. Okay. Sir. So anyways, while we're getting, there on, uh, getting that on the screen, um, the judges ask Plato. You play slideshow. Play, click on play slideshow. Down the bottom. Play. There Same. you go. Ah. Bigger. Yeah. OK, there's Socrates, OK, and his followers. And so the jury votes. Um, not unanimously, but they vote um, in making, they, they vote that he should drink hemlock and die. And um, before they do that, though, they say, Socrates, um, if we find you guilty, what do you think your punishment should be? And Socrates says, well, then, uh, I should be punished by being a ward of the state given everything that I can have. So he's constantly playing with his accusers. So in the end, uh, Socrates making the point up to heaven, he takes his hemlock and dies and um, and he just he also it. refused to plead. He could have yeah, right. He could have flunked. He could have left Athens, but he chose not to. It's the same thing that happened to Lynn. Um, Lynn when Lynn was put in prison, um, basically he was, he was told by the powers that be that if he gave up the executive intelligence review, and basically, his political career, he didn't have to go to jail. And Lynn said, no way. <laughs> so they, they, uh, they put Lynn in prison. And they almost killed him while he was in prison. Um, I think Dennis Speed's statement that was put on the website is pretty appropriate. Yeah. Which one? On Martin Luther King? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Martin Luther King. I don't have that with me now. But the... Where he says, wait, where, where, where would I want to be? And he said, right here. Right. If I want to be anywhere, I'd be right here. Right here. And then right he here. talks about 
uh, going to the uh, going to the mountaintop, mm -hmm. and that I may not get there with you, but you know you're going to the promised land, which is what which exactly what happens with Moses. The same thing. Um, Okay, he says, um, you two gentlemen of the jury must look forward to death with confidence and fix your minds on this one belief, which is certain, that nothing can harm a good man either in life or after death, and his fortunes are not a matter of indifference to the gods. This present experience of mine has come about has not come about mechanically. I'm quite clear that the time had come when it was better for me to die and be released from my distractions. That is why my sign never turned, turned me back. For my own part, I bear no grudge at all against those who condemned me and accused me, although it was not with this kind of intention that they did so. But because they thought they were hurting me, and that is culpable of them. However, I asked them to grant me one favor. When my sons grow up, gentlemen, if you think that they are putting money or anything else before goodness, take your revenge by plaguing them as I plagued you. And if they fancy themselves for no reason, you must scold them just as I scolded you for neglecting the important things and thinking that they are good for something when they are good for nothing. If you do this, I shall have had justice at your hands, both I, myself, and my children. Now it is time that we are going, I to die and you to live. But which of us has the happier prospect is unknown to anyone but God, and that's the, that's his final words, as reported by Plato. So um, there we have the death of Socrates. Now, what's interesting is um, Philo, Philo Judaeus. Who, unfortunately, I wish people knew more about. Believe it or not, these are all of Philo's writings. And most, any, everybody's not even one, read one thing out of it. Um, and he was the um, leading Platonist, follower of Socrates of his period. And he wrote, um, he writes on various things, on the confusion of tongues, on finding in flight, on dreams, on the life of Moses. He writes all of this stuff, and he has a particular section called On Virtues, which is exactly what Plato had dealt with. And um, what he goes through is that he says of, on courage, Having previously said all that appeared to be necessary about justice and those precepts which are closely connected with it, I now proceed in regular order to speak of courage, not meaning by courage that warlike and frantic delirium under the influence of passion as its counselor, which the generality of men take for it, but knowledge. So he's... Uh, he is defining courage in, the, in this case as being knowledge. And he says, these men that, that who practice real courage, being studiers and pra practicers of wisdom, but those other men have only what does not deserve to be called, though it assumes the name, 
as they live in that incurable disease, ignorance, which one may find, which one may very fitly and properly call audacity, just as people say that in coins, base metal often bears the same impression as the real stamp in money. So he goes on in this, and rather than read it to you, I'll just give you just a highlight of what he goes through. He talks about courage, wisdom, uh, on humanity, on God. There is no created being who is truly God, but such a one is only in appearance and opinion being destitute of the most indispensable quality of God, namely eternity. So, and he quotes from the Old Testament, and um, he sends it at the end. The standard of nobleness has been an object of desire not only to God-living men, but likewise to women who have discarded ignorance in which they've been brought up, which taught them to honor as deities creatures made with hands, and have learnt instead of knowledge of there being only one supreme ruler of the universe by whom the whole world is governed and regulated. So that's near the end of his uh, disquisition on virtues. So it's very clear you know, that he's talking about one God. And if you take what Plato does in uh, the Mino dialogue, what he does towards the end of his life, where he, you know, he offers it up to God, and what Philo talks about in taking that thread uh, about virtues toward knowing God, what you have is you have the basis for another G, another uh, leap, another hypothesizing of the higher hypothesis, which would be Christ. Okay. Now my my I cannot prove it to you. I can only hypothesize to you that Philo was his teacher. But I'm trying to make that case by reading you short selections from both Plato and Philo so that you get a sense of this. But um, I'll give you a Take what Lynn says. Talk all creative, take all creative development by all mankind and all analogous development within the universe at large. All creative development signifies a single, efficient, creative intelligence which exists in all time, all space, as if all time and space were compacted into a single indivisible event. The manyness of creativity, Plato's becoming, is thus being, is thus defined implicitly as the one, which is Plato's good or God. Um, and then he, what Lynn does is he sets this up against the environmentalists of the day and the oligarchs. And you take Prince Philip you take the queen, you take uh, these environmentalists who are pushing green policies, and this is Zeus. This means the end of humanity. This means the end of human history. Because what they're saying is that you're no better than an animal, that you cannot know things, and that knowledge 
Um, is it is an ephemeral quality, uh, and that you cannot um, you cannot impart knowledge from one uh, person to another. That all all mankind can do is um, eat, sleep, exist, mate, procreate. You know this is this is you know man as animal. And so he, you know, this is what he goes through. You have no intelligence. Is that what you're saying? You have no, no not intelligence. Creativity. No way of thinking. No creativity. So um, what, what Christ does in his mission is he develops the unhypothesized higher hypothesis. How, well, how does he do that? Well, let's compare for a moment Socrates and Christ. You saw the picture here of Socrates and his death, OK? Um, Socrates was a very good man, but if you take the issue of Christ, you're going to a much higher level. You're going to a level um, <clears throat> that can be repeated, but before Christ, man had never seen. Can I give that picture, please? I want to contrast Socrates' death with the death of Christ, because um, Socrates was about 70 or 80, and they gave him some poison to drink. But the Romans, uh, the Romans under Tiberius, came in and they tortured him for an entire day beat him till he was black and blue, and then strung him up and nailed him to uh, a cross. What was the slideshow? Which one? Down there. This one? Hmm? Yes. OK. So I'm, I'm using that picture just to give you a sense of, in, in real time, what it must have been like for him. And, um, you know, the, the thing about Christ that's so important to realize is, is, is that he has um, two, character, two characteristics. He's both human and he's divine at the same time. And you can't separate that. Because once you separate that, and you say, no, Christ wasn't divine, he was just a man, then what are you saying about humanity? What are you saying about um, man made in the image of God? Well, you're, you're saying then, that everyone is just a man or a woman. There are no higher ideals to aspire to. There, there are no higher, there are no divine things. Uh, there's no such thing as divinity as right. higher ideals. Right. Everyone is just a man or a woman. So we may as well be just like animals, right. well, which biologically we are. Biologically, we're part of the animal kingdom. Ah. But man is the highest form of animal. Why is it? He has a mind, he can think. Okay, he has and a mind. Yeah, 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 compared to the lower animals that live just by brain, by jungle. Or right. But biologically, we are part of the animal kingdom, but we're the highest form of animal. We have a mind, we can be creative. 
and so on. Well, I, I sort of reject the idea of animalism, period. Wow. I think you have animals and then you have people. Okay, this is, this is what I, I, would, um, I would say to you about how it works. This is that you have, um, that you have uh, creatures, okay, animals, but I think when you, like if you read Genesis, um, when God is done with heaven and earth, when he's done creating the animal kingdom, uh, he sits down and basically what he wants is something he can converse with, have a dialogue with, and then he creates man. And if man is in the image of God, through his mind, as you say, because we have a brain, dogs have a brain, everybody, you know, in terms of parts, almost everything, you know, you can, he has some sort of brain. Okay. You have a mind. Exactly. You have a higher. A higher. Brain. That's right. That's, that's right. So, um, so what does that, um, what does that mean um, for, for us today? Anybody have uh, uh, any ideas about that? <laughs> Do people know about three different types of love that exist? Somebody just blurted it out the answer. That's okay. I'll write it down anyway, because probably. All right. In Greek, there are three words for love. In English, there's only one. The Greeks have a one called Eros, which in English um, is erotic love. The love between, um, well, I don't have to go with you, you know exactly what I'm talking about, yeah. Eros. Second of all, the Greeks have another word. I'm not sure if it's spelled like this or not. Caritas, which in English means charity. Okay, but you generally don't associate charity with love. You usually associate charity with uh, uh, Easter seals, you know, giving money to the poor, that sort of thing. You don't think of it as a form of love. But in the Greek period, this was uh, looked at as, you know, the, the love of your um, friends, the love of your children, um, the love of your husband. There's not a very good English word that describes it. 
all you can say is love. But it's the highest form of love that you can possibly have. And what it is, is it's the love that you have for your fellow man and for God. That's the highest love you can achieve. And that's why I wanted to bring up uh, Plato, Philo, and Christ, because in each circumstance, you know, you have this higher ideal that people are willing to die for, be tortured and die for this idea of love. Love for man. And love for your fellow man, your neighbor, okay? What was that other thing? I just got it. What, charity? No, 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 I'm oh. not pay. Love for your fellow man. Love for your fellow man and for God. Yeah. Oh. <coughs> because if man is created in God's image, mm -hmm. you know, when you love humanity, who are you expressing your love yeah. for? I mean, it's for that individual person or individual people. But what you love is innately, you know, what they represent, which is, you know, usually the good, the unhypothesized hypothesis. That's what you love. So I will take any and all questions. Yeah, I have a question. The, the last word of uh, the word. Agape? Yeah, agape. We don't have the word, I mean, it's not been demonstrated from the 21st century. But what we talk about it has not been demonstrated. Among people, but, uh, well, Martin Luther King, who is not the 21st century, yeah, he, but Martin Luther King did have agape love. Yeah, I would. Very much so. And um, if you've ever seen, uh, there's this, uh, when Martin Luther King is being buried, uh, Bobby Kennedy is at his gravesite giving the eulogy. And what Bobby Kennedy does is absolutely heartbreaking. He quotes from uh, Aeschylus on, you know, the good man. And, you know, he, he talks about um, Martin Luther King as if he were Socrates. So, um, you know, you, you had glimpses of this in the 20th century, you know. The 21st century, you know, I guess over the last 14 years, hmm, what do we had? George Bush, and George Obama, Bush. And George Bush. Uh, let's Dick see, Cheney. what else? Dick Cheney, <laughs> who else? Uh, well, I'm not there are all the people that want to torture the ones that we are after. That's right. We got all the tortures there. You live in a Zeusian well, society. What's the summers, what, what's this, uh, this full name that he was our, uh, Samantha Summers? I mean, uh, oh, uh, Larry Summers. Larry Summers. Larry Summers. Summers and people like that. Well, also we have Mr. Kerry, who has turned into, from a, a Vietnam hero, he's become a, uh, a vulture. Mm -hmm. Turned into a. Mm -hmm. uh, Wait a minute, just hold on. Eugene? Yeah, and there's these three kinds of love, and there are also different kinds of love, like your love for your mother and father is not the same kind of love as your love for, for your girlfriend or wife. That's what these three are. That's what I'm pointing out. I'm saying well, the there are three well, that there is love, but there are three different kinds. You don't love your child like you love your husband. Yeah, it, it's not. But it's, it's love. A different expression. It's, it, it's not the same. Even your love for a brother or sister, which is part of the family, 
is not the same feeling, the same kind of love as for your mother or, or, or father. It, it's different in a way. You know? But uh, yeah, I know what you're saying. But you see, what 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 I'm getting at with agape is 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 that you love your neighbor as much as you love your mother and father. No, but that's a different kind of thing. No, it's agape. I mean, your neighbor is not your mother and father. It doesn't matter. The, 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 it doesn't matter. The, the idea of, of love, if you have to, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, in St. Matthew and in St. Mark, um, Jesus is uh, with his disciples and um, they run into Mary and Jesus' brothers and sisters. And uh, what happens is that uh, the disciples say, Jesus, isn't that your, your, your mother there and your brothers and sisters? And he says, yes. He says, but you're my family too. He says to the disciples, you know, in other words, I love you as much as I love them. And I guess it's the same thing. That's it's on a high, it's on a high, high level. It's 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 not less than that. It's more. It's not less than that. You, you, it's agape is something that is very special. And it's it's only towards humanity. I have a dog that I love, you know, but I can't say I have a gothic love for my dog. I love him because he's a, a funny, silly little creature that has a brain. And uh, but does he have a does he have a mind that he can reason with? No, not really. Some of the things I see him do are disgusting, you know. I still love him. <laughs> so, you wanted to talk, Omar. You had your hand up, no? I just forgot the question. Okay. So, um, let me look at the time. Okay, yeah. Now, when Jesus was questioning Peter, and you know, okay, we have the word love, and back then, there were three loves. Mm -hmm. So Jesus starts out with Peter, and he says, do you agape me? And Peter responds, not with the agape word, but he says, yes, Lord, you know that I, in English, we would say love you, but he's, what he was saying was the, the other one, I think the word was phileo. Phileo would be comparable to charitas. Phileo means That's love. That's just the Latin version, I think. Latin version, Same. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so, so he responds with that version, and then, and then God bumps it down, and he says the second one, and then, and he, then, he has, then he has to go to Peter's level, and then Peter keeps repeating, not agape, or the, or the, which is the first level, or the second level, but he, Peter remains at the third level, and, and Jesus accepts Peter at the third level because of his love for Peter, and, mm -hmm. and he says, and ultimately he says, feed my sheep. Mm -hmm. You love me, feed my sheep. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and of course, what does he mean by that? Well, you know, help the people. Exactly. You know, be a shepherd. Right. Just like he was, he was a shepherd. Right. That's how he, that is his metaphor of how he, Right. his metaphor of, of dealing with life, that's the way he saw himself. Yep. Now, um, so, you in the Bible, it's it's very interesting because um, the way that uh, the Bible treats uh, Saint Mark, Saint Matthew. Jesus is found um, at one point 
where he's sitting down and, and, and eating with a bunch of people. And the Pharisees come to him and say, what, what do you have to do with these people? These people are sinners. You're hanging around with sinners. And, uh, you know, isn't that bad? Shouldn't you be associating yourself with us? And what, you know, Jesus does is basically he says that when a man is sick, he needs a physician. He <laughs> says, uh, think not that I come to send peace. I came not to send peace, but a sword. And by that, he means the, uh, the idea of knowledge, that he, the, the sword of knowledge, um, which, um, which divides uh, <clears throat> men from animals. Um, also, you know, uh, what, what Christ does is his teaching is, it's a little bit like Socrates, but it's not exactly the same. Um, because what Christ uses is parables. He uses stories to uh, teach people what goodness, love, charity, virtue. He uses all these different examples. Wow. And um, he has a, one of the famous ones that's taken, that's taken up is um, the parable of the mustard seed, which probably most people know of or know about. Yeah where the idea is, you know, the farmer goes out and he's throwing mustard seeds on the ground. And some of them fall on thorns and they don't grow. Some of them fall on rocks. Um, some of them just land on top of the dirt so the birds come to eat them. And then a bunch of them will actually fall on good ground and grow. And one of the um, interesting things about uh, the mustard seed is, is that it's, once it grows, it is one of, one of the biggest plants that you can imagine. It's very, very powerful. Um, it's, uh, that's the famous saying, as you sow, so shall you reap. Right. Yeah. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, what they're always trying to do is basically when they see him, they're always saying, show me a sign from heaven. Prove to me that you are the Son of God. Now, what's interesting to me is, is that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, Jesus never says he is the Son of God. He says, I am the Son of Man. In St. John, he says that he's the son of God. So I, I'm throwing that out to you because I think that's a, an important thing that, that you should think about um, for a moment. And it also goes back to the idea of, of um, man being in, made in the image of God. Wasn't John was written later. John was written later, but so and were they all. Therefore, more removed. Well, um, most of the Gospels were written about approximately 25 to 30 years after the death of Christ. And Pontius Pilate, um, his wife, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, was related to Tiberius. I believe Pilate's wife was. Uh, his daughter or his niece. So when he sent Pilate to Judea, I mean, basically they were getting reports the entire time 
you know, of what Christ was doing. The Romans were not unaware of what Christ was up to. His ministry took three years. When you read the Gospels, it sounds like it takes place in three weeks. <laughs> but it doesn't. He, this takes place over a period of three years. Uh, and this is, um, this is a, a, a real, uh, uh, this is, he is creating a movement around the idea, as I said, as, of agape, around the idea that you should, you know, that the highest good is just that you love your neighbor as yourself. This is the highest good. And um, so, so Christ's mission is attracting many hundreds and thousands of people in Judea. So they sent Pilate after him, and um, Pilate uses uh, the um, evil faction of the uh, Jewish priesthood who are jealous of the fact that Jesus is gathering all of these people and preaching to them and performing miracles of all types and, and whatnot. And the Romans, they, they're out to kill this guy, as you saw before. They, it's, it's not enough that they, that they simply <coughs> kill him like they killed Socrates. It's that they actually torture and crucify him. So um, this, is, uh, this is something we're going to view again in the Prometheus versus Zeus uh, stories. But the next time I'm going to look at St. Paul uh, through St. Augustine. Um, because the question that I have in my mind is, what happened after the death of Christ? How did Christianity, which was really, I think, um, at first thought of as a reform of Judaism, how did Christianity grow between the death of Christ all the way up to St. Augustine, who was like one of the greatest of the church uh, founders. Because the Romans went to every, uh, they went to every step of the way to, um, to wipe out the memory of, of Christ being alive. Um, they took the Christians, they fed them to the lions. I mean, the persecution was just unbelievable. And it was on and off for a period of 300 years. And um, the next time we'll be talking more of that. But, you know, um, unless you have more questions, this is, this is really uh, my presentation to you for the day. So, yeah, Giselle. Sorry, this was the presentation. But what is your uh, idea, your thinking, like how Christians have been being persecuted for so long to being the dominant religion on the planet? I didn't hear the last part. Persecuted for so long? Persecuted for so long by the Romans, but now the Roman Empire, before it was totally defunct, adapted Christianity as its own, and now it's the dominant religion. Well, there are a billion Christians, but there are also about a billion people uh, of, uh, of the Islamic faith, too. Yes, but the, the people of the Christian faith dominate in economics and politics. Oh, well, yeah, well, you have Christians who aren't Christians. <laughs> Christians who are named. They claim to be. They claim to be Christians, but they're not. What I really want to know is why, how did they, how did Christianity come to be the dominant religion in the world? Well, the answer is, um, I think in what, I think that 
you're rushing me to my next class. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's. Um, well, that's a. I have to. I have to say that's a kind of a. That's a tough one to answer because the, the question itself, like she was just saying, you have people who call themselves Christians, but to be dominating uh, economically, that's a whole. That's a whole other. That's a whole other thing because. Throughout, throughout history, you had people that that did conceptualize the ideas of Christ from the agape, as she mentioned. That's what that's the part that Lynn keeps going through in his papers, like Cusa, Nicholas of Cusa, Kepler. That's that that concept, right on and off, has sparked groups that actually wanted to exude those qualities in society. And to be able to to use those methods, like the Council of Florence, Lynn talks about that a lot, or like you know Brunelleschi's dome, you know all these things. They're not just like really neat things to do. Oh, isn't that really cool? But like to be able to put yourself in the position where you can actually affectionately show that to right. the population that we are not beasts. It's not just surface level aesthetics, like you know trim your nails and stuff. Right, but then you also had this other faction that was at war with that idea, and they were truly Roman. Even some of them were popes, right? That accumulated and amass all this gold and wealth and you know these things. And you have them today in the form of the the modern day oligarchy, the British they, Empire, huh? The British Empire, the British Empire? Mm -hmm. absolutely. And so and their whores in the United States, you know, Obama and the rest. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah. I always heard, I heard that Jesus Christ didn't die on the horse. Some people think he didn't even exist. He didn't like it. You know, there, there, there is, you know, I, when I was going through and <coughs> researching the stuff on the, um, on the internet, I kept running across these weird papers about how you know, he was a total fiction, you know, which I, I don't believe. I don't think that's true. I, I mean, the idea of him being a fiction, I, I don't think that's true. And they're making their point, they're making their point because he never wrote anything. Well, Socrates never wrote anything either. Plato wrote about Socrates. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul wrote about the life of Christ. So, um, you know, he he did exist. And what what were you saying about that? There was another point you were making? No, the, you know, I, well, my mother always said that Jesus didn't die on the floor. And then, she never explained it. So I, you know, don't need Oh, to okay. Probably what she meant is just that that she talks about his divinity, that he didn't die. That he is alive, mm -hmm. okay, in people, mm -hmm. and a lot of people who are not Christian. I'll give you a very good example, is, in, is uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Mm -hmm. Gandhi, Gandhi was a, a Hindu, but he took from the Bible, he took Christ's example of nonviolence to the bitter end. I mean, if any of you have, you know, seen, I'm sure you've seen the film, if you haven't, go see it, rent it, rent Gandhi. Because that's his whole thing all the way through. He's imprisoned, you know, he, he will, you know, his people are beaten, but they refuse to fight back. It's like the Christians and the lions, you know, throwing them. And, and something like that, that just, that was Martin Luther King's version of how, the, how they were going to, um, Stops, stop modern day slavery. 
was the issue of nonviolence, which I think, you know, once you experience that or you see that in somebody else, it really shakes you. You really have to say, you know, what powerful, you know, uh, motive do people have? I mean, when Lynn went to jail, I mean, that really freaked people out, I have to say. Um, he was tried in Boston. He was tried and uh, after about eight or nine months of being tried in Boston, we were able to get out all this information on George Bush and how the Bush family was involved in setting Lynn up. And we got the stuff into the court trials. So they declared a mistrial. And, re and they couldn't retry him on the, um, on the things they said in Boston because it would have been double jeopardy. So they took the trial. They moved it to Virginia, drew up other things. Um, and basically, they, um, they gave him basically a death sentence. I think they said 15 years which would have been a death sentence had it not been for Clinton intervening at a certain point. Um, but I remember uh, Lynn had um, some medical procedures that he had to go through. And um, what happened was he, was he was, I think, doing kitchen work and getting up very, very early in the morning. And this procedure he was having um, was, was a tough one. And uh, usually people rested way before they had this procedure. But the, um, the prison decided to work him before he had the procedure, hoping that he'd kill him. Mm. And so what we did is we just went on a major mobilization um, I remember being in New Hampshire at the time, and I went over to Sununu's house, who was at that point Reagan's, uh, he Reagan's man or Bush's? Reagan. He was Reagan's man. Um, and I went to Sununu's house. Uh, he wasn't there, but I talked to his kids and told them about Lynn and told him that he should intervene uh, on behalf of LaRouche to make sure, you know, that he wasn't uh, murdered in prison. And then um, we drove up to Kennebunkport uh, at Bush's home on that peninsula. And we drove, it was very funny, it was uh, uh, one other person and me, and I wasn't the driver. So we wanted to get to Bush's house. So we drove around. Um, the area, and at every sign, every you know, 14 feet, do not stop, do not stop, do not stop, do not stop, as you're riding past, you know, the peninsula where Bush's house is. So we went by, and I think it was the third time I said, stop the car. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy looked at me, and I said, seriously, stop the freaking car. So he stopped the car. I got out of the car. I had this book in my hand called Railroad, which is the story of how Lynn was railroaded. And I walked all the way up to the line between the, uh, the, uh, the uh, earth and, no, I didn't walk past security. No, I didn't want to get killed. Yeah, yeah. I walked, you know, from security right to the point where the peninsula was. And I just stood there with the book. And Secret Service is running down. <laughs> They're running down, you know. And uh, uh, I presented them the book and I said, um, this is from Helga LaRouche. And uh, we're putting President Bush on notice that um, if he, if LaRouche dies, that it's that the blood is on his hands. And the Secret Service said, they were just totally uh, freaked out that I had done that. You know, when it said, do not stop, do not stop, do not stop. 
So they took the book and, um, I mean, but we were doing things like that. We were visiting governors, we were visiting heads of political parties, heads of unions. Um, it was, uh, it was a real fight uh, to keep Lynn alive. And um, I think Lynn, to a large degree, has, to, has absolutely demonstrated this idea of agape. So I would say probably to Giselle that in the 21st century, you know, you have Lynn and you have, um, you know, the people who are around them. And that's, I mean, you, we have allies. There are allies for sure. There are allies in Russia. There are allies in China. There are allies in India. There is allies in the streets, I'm sure. But um, I think we're it. I, you know, I really do. I think we're it. What were you going to say? Chris O'Dellis said something last night that was kind of confusing to me. Perhaps you might be able to throw some light on it. He was making a distinction between soul and spirit. I thought they were one, one and the same. Who is doing that? Who is saying it's a different? A, a minister out of Georgia. Oh. Called Quetlo Dollar. Uh-huh. Yeah. Is your spirit and the soul one and the same as I thought? I would think it is. But he was seeming to make a differentiation, but he didn't. But he didn't say what, what he meant. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they say that when you're alive, you possess a soul, and that soul is immortal, mm -hmm. right? And that you can destroy the body, the you vessel of it, but the you soul. can't destroy the soul. Right. And the whole thing about living and, you know, existing is what you do for your soul, how you live your life. That's what's immortal about you. It's n nothing else but that. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I don't, I mean, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, I see it as, this, as the same idea. And unless he means something different by spirit, I, I would tend to think that they would be the same. I don't know if anybody else has another idea about that, about soul versus spirit. Angel? I'm just going on a limb here. Okay. I, I didn't see the sermon, so I, I don't know. But I am familiar with um, Mr. Dollar. I used to live in Georgia. Oh. Uh, military perhaps, so it's been around. Um, you could have someone in prison who has like a really bad reputation. <coughs> maybe they made a bad mistake, and maybe they've been sitting there for a while and never up. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they have a bad spirit. They have a bad, a bad aura about them. Mm -hmm. But they're a good person, or they have redeemed themselves. Kind of like Shawshank Redemption, in that sense. I don't know if that was like the inclination, but that's probably the closest thing I could. Uh huh. Imagine. Hmm. Hmm. Well, he may have meant that. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, anybody else have an idea? Well, can, can spirit also be interpreted in a sense as the kind of mood that you're in? Your, your soul may, may not be the same as spirit. Your soul would mean either you're a good person at heart or, or an evil person, like like Hitler was, let's mm -hmm. say. But <laughs> like Obama so could be about Obama. <laughs> in various phases, like you could be in a good mood or an evil mood, or that could be part of your well, soul. Well, maybe, maybe. But it, it's not the same way as your soul. Okay, you know, all right, I'll accept that. Yeah.
I'll accept that. Okay. That you're that at that basically you're a good person. You're saying, Mind but you make mistakes. You make mistakes. You may be in various kinds of right. Things. So that you're seeing like the spirit. That that I see what you say. I yeah. see what you're saying. I would say, yeah, that would probably be closer to the truth. 